So our sermon this morning, the title that I picked for it is Your Calling Versus Others, The No-Win Comparison. Let me just start off with a few anecdotals and some jokes regarding comparisons. So Sherlock Holmes and his companion, Dr. Watson, are are camping together. And uh, they go to sleep. And Sherlock wakes up and says to Watson, Tell me, Watson, what can you see when you're looking up? Thousands of stars, says Watson. And what's your conclusion from all of this, says Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson starts to think, and then he says, if I considered it from astrological aspects, he says, I must assume that there are millions and millions of stars and galaxies in the universe. From psychological points of view, I conclude that we're so infinitely small in comparison with God's overall creation. And if meteorology is concerned, I would say that we can expect fine weather tomorrow. What's your opinion, Holmes? My opinion is that you're a fool, Watson, because our tent has been stolen. (laughs) Here's a short one. People say you can't compare apples to oranges. I always seemed like a fruitful comparison to me, though. Yes, a groaner. Went went from laughs to groans. Anyway, all my friends have great big bucket lists. Mine is just a little pale in comparison. There you go. No more jokes, I promise. Um, I'm wondering this morning if any of you have what I have, and it's uh, a bit of a love-hate relationship with Facebook and Instagram. Anybody there have that love-hate relationship? Yeah, there's a few, okay. I love the fact that you can stay in touch with people, that you, you can see what's going around with your friends and your family members and different things like that. There's always funny anecdotals and meaningful posts. And when I look at what I have and what I put out there, I got nothing. I I think I have an Instagram account. I have one picture that I've posted. It's of the dog. And I I think that's it. I really got nothing. I got nothing to share with the world, really. And I did take a break. I, I, I managed 21 days without any Facebook posts and stuff. Margie held me accountable to it. She checked in with me on, uh, on occasion saying, Hey, no, no, no posting, no looking. So I I can do it. I managed to do it. But the the thing is, you look at some of the people that you're friends with or following on Instagram, and you're going, man, what a life. You know, or what a talent, or what abilities, or wow, I wish I could do that, or man, I wish I looked that good in my late 50s and all this other kind of stuff. And you're like, you get to the point where you hate it. You know, like you're kind of like you're having a good day and then you, you see something on Facebook like that and it just it ruins it because your friend's got a better one going on or something like that. And you go, oh, my life sucks compared to theirs. Uh, my brother Grant is a middle child. Do we have any middle children in here? A few? OK, maybe this is you. I don't know. But this was definitely my brother. So my brother Grant would always compare food portions. That was his thing. My mom would be busy serving. We had, I have, I have two older brothers. I'm the baby in the family. And then there's my dad. So my mom would refer to the four boys because my dad, like me, was just a big kid at heart. And so she, you know, she'd be feeding us all the time and stuff. And, you know, we'd have dessert, let's say. And so everybody's getting some apple pie. And my brother Grant would go, Mom, Dale's piece of pie is bigger than mine. And Barry's got more ice cream on his. And he was always doing that. My mom would serve up dinner, and he would look, and he would compare his portion to everybody else, and it had to be fair. So-and-so's got more than me. And I know, middle children 
you know, you don't have all the responsibilities that the, the oldest gets and, you know, the oldest is, gets to do everything first, everything like that. And we know, do we not, babies, that we're always considered spoiled, you know, and favored and blah, 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 and more, more talented and better looking. And I mean, we, we, know, we know all about that. Anyway, I always just found it so interesting that Grant would always compare. He's always comparing. But you know what? We do that too. And the fastest way, I think, for any of us to kill something special is to compare it to something else. And it's not just what someone has. You know, you look at some people and, and you go, man, their wardrobe is immense. They got more clothes than Marx and Cranbrooks. You know, more shoes than Nordstrom carries, things like that. Or it's not just where someone goes. You see someone and they're showing you their holiday photos. You know, they took a vacation in Barbados and all you can afford is the backyardos. <laughs> you know, that's your vacation. And it's not what someone has and it's not so much what someone does, it's, or, or, or goes, I should say, it's what they do that really gets me. Now, I'm, I'm confessing here. I am not a do-it-yourselfer kind of guy. Sorry, I, my cord here is just driving me nuts this morning. Uh, I'm not very handy. I'm not a handy man in terms of uh, being able to do the fix-it things around the house. Man, I'm, I'm lucky I can even fix a sandwich. You know, that's the kind of thing. I, I can't build anything at all. And unfortunately, my wife appreciates guys who can repair and build things because that's what she kind of grew up with. Her dad, a little, um, little picture here. There we go. That's uh, Sue's sister and her family and her dad there. Her dad is great with hammer and wood and saw and all that kind of stuff. He built her a dresser and a desk way back in the day. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I can't, I can't do that, you know? So her dad can build stuff. Can he preach a sermon? Probably not. And then, then there's my brother-in-law. So there's my, my father-in-law. There's my brother-in-law, Kevin. Oh, how I loathe Kevin. For one, he's a Cal Calgary City policeman. So he's got a cool job. Right? He's like, God, he's a cop. That's cool. But the other thing that drives me nuts about Kevin is he can do anything. He can fix anything. He's super handy. Like, he's the know-it-all guy. You know, he's been an electrician, and he, and he does home renos, and he does, like, he's just so good at everything. But can he sing? No. Can he act? No. Can he do impressions? No, I was going to say, can he play the drums? But he probably could, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but here's the thing. I know that I can't do what they do. But they can't do what I do. And they were called to one thing, and so was I. So here's the thing. The reason you can't do what someone else can do it's because you weren't called to their purpose. That's worth repeating. The reason you can't do what someone else can do is because you weren't called to their purpose. Now, in terms of the seasons, what we were, we've been talking about in the last couple of, of weeks, we talked about there's purpose in the pain. There's a reason why we go through some, some tough times. It's so that God prepares us for what is ahead, makes us stronger. Was it Nietzsche that said, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger? And that's so much true. There's a lot of truth in that. God prepares us. There's a reason for the pain. And then the second, last week's message, we talked about what's your one thing 
Have you, anybody remember? Man, I hope you guys do. Anybody remember what your one thing is? We revealed that secret. What is your one thing? To serve God by serving others. That's the whole reason why you were called. Why Christ chose you is our purpose on earth here is to serve God by serving others. That's the one thing. That's our one thing. But what we end up doing when we decide, okay, we're going to serve God, and this is how I'm going to serve God, is that we start comparing our calling to those of others. We say, man, I wish I could sing like that, or I wish I could do that, or I wish I had that person's spiritual gifts or whatever. What we need to do is stop comparing our calling to others. Let me just open in a word of prayer before we really dig in. Father, thank you that not only do you give us a purpose in life, but that you help us accomplish that purpose. And please help us, Lord, not to compare ourselves with others. That we are uniquely made to serve the purpose you have called us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a recap from last week. Find your one thing. Serve God by serving others. Your purpose is not for you. Your purpose is for God. You don't find your purpose. You serve God's purpose. And if you want to serve God's purpose, start by serving God's people. If you're taking notes, first point I want to make this morning is this. You are perfectly created by God to fulfill God's purpose for you. Let me repeat that again. You are perfectly created by God to fulfill God's purpose for you. There's been no one in the past like you. There is no one present like you. And there will be no one in the future like you. God made you for a purpose. And he gave you everything you need to fulfill that purpose as well. A verse that I love to talk about when I go to um, Bible camps and speak to kids, I usually bring this verse up because I think kids need to hear it now more than ever. And we're no different. We're just big kids. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are God's what? Masterpiece. Masterpiece. And I hope you believe that. When I ask the kids, can anybody tell me what masterpiece means? What does the word masterpiece mean? And one kid shot up his hand real quick and I said, okay, go ahead. And he gave the best definition. I use it all the time now. He says, we are, a, a masterpiece is the best of the best. I said, you got it. You nailed it. So what does that verse say? It says, we are God's best. We are God's masterpiece. We are the best thing that God made. Out of all the things he created, we are the best. Some versions say we are God's workmanship. In the Greek, the word is Poema. Everybody say poema. Poema. And what that word means is we are poetry. We are God's poetic statement. We are the best, his masterpiece, his greatest work, the workmanship of God. Here's the thing. Everything that God created was created for a purpose. Everything God created was created for a purpose. You read in Genesis chapter 1 that God created the heavens and the earth, and he said it was good. And then God created this and this, and he said it was good. And then God created all the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, and God said it was good. And then God creates man in his own image, and what does he say after that? And God said it was very 
good. We are the best of the best, the best of God's creation. God doesn't make junk. God does not make junk. God is perfect in all that he does, in all his ways. So how could God make junk? Or how could God make a mistake? Or God, how could God make an accident? We are none of those things. And even though the devil might try and tell us that we are, and that we're no good, and that we're a failure or a loss, we're not. Your birth is evidence that your purpose is necessary. You're here for a reason. And you might as well just start living that out now. Because the worst thing you can do is waste time by not doing it. There is no substitute for you. No one else can fulfill the purpose that God has for you. Nobody else can step into your shoes and take it over. Because you are created by God to do God's work, then do it for God's glory. That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. We're not going to do it for the approval of others or to impress the crowd or to please them. Who is them? Well, them is, is they, I guess, for another word. But you know what? Who cares what they think? We're in the world, not of the world. We shouldn't care what the world has to say or thinks. But here's the thing. Comparison is the enemy of calling. Comparison is the enemy of calling. Because as soon as you start to compare yourself with others, you take away from the glory of God. You start to question God. You know, why God? Why did you make me this way? Why, why couldn't I have great hair like Wanda? <laughs> you know, why? God says, well, I need some more light bouncing off your head to, you know, perhaps people will think they're having a vision when the light bounces off your head like that, Barry. I don't know. But as soon as we start comparing ourselves to others, we, we downscale God's creation. We, downs, we downsize God's call on our lives. And we start to question God, which to me, that's a no-win. It's, it's like worrying. You know, when Jesus talks about worrying, does, does it add a minute to your day if you worry? What does worrying do? It does absolutely nothing except probably cause you to, to not do it because you're too afraid to do it. It's the same with comparison. There's no good in it whatsoever. There's a, there's a no win in comparison, as Andy Stanley likes to say. that I, I stole that from Andy Stanley. No win in comparison. There isn't. It does absolutely no good whatsoever. Point number two. You can't fulfill God's purpose for you when you're comparing to someone else. That's what it does. You know, God calls you to do something and you're comparing it, you're comparing your calling to somebody else and you go, but I can't do it as well as so-and-so. I don't have their talents. I don't have their abilities. I can't do that like they do it. And God goes, I don't want you to do it like they do it. I didn't make you to do it the way they do it. I made you to do it the way that you would do it. That's why I called you. If I wanted so-and-so to do it, I would call them to do it. I've called you. So fulfill it. But you know what? We're not alone. I love the fact that when we read God's word, he gives us these examples. And it's not, you know, the average Joe. It's usually like a big hero in the Bible kind of thing, right? And they struggle with the same things that we struggle with. And you go, ah, thank the Lord for these guys. Thank the Lord for a guy like Peter. Remember we talked about Peter? We picked on Peter a little while back. You know, we talked about David and David made mistakes too, you know. Well, here's, here's a classic example of the comparison thing. So let's look at John chapter 20. And uh, 
This is, this is John. John did the comparison thing. John was a little insecure about himself. John talked about himself in the third person quite a bit. And how did he refer to himself in the third person? What did he, what was the little, little thing that John always referred to himself as? Al's smiling because he knows, right? It's the one Jesus loved, John the beloved. Like he'd never say it was me, John. He said, and the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's a little insecurity there, don't you think? Right? It's like if you were talking about yourself in the third person, you say, well, and, and the third son in the family, the one that mom loved. <laughs> <laughs> what was the guy's name? Barry. Oh, yeah, really? But that's what he does. And John does this. And in John chapter 20, you have the John versus Peter rivalry or the John versus Peter comparison. So it's, it's classic. So you st it starts off with early Sunday morning. What happened that Sunday morning? Special Sunday morning. That's Resurrection Sunday, right? Mary comes and with, uh, with a group of gals and they visit the tomb and the tomb is empty. So she takes off and goes to find the disciples to tell them. Okay, now notice how many times John tells you he is faster than Peter. Okay, tomb's empty, Christ is risen, but that's not really the important part so much as John has to put in the fact that he's faster. Okay, so we're reading it right out of the Bible here. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, Okay, he's got to stick that in there. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Woohoo! Winner! Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and then he saw and believed. Isn't that hilarious? Like, Job just can't let it go. I, there's some insecurities there. John needs a little help, I think. But you know what? We're so much like that. Ugh, aren't we? We do the same thing. You know, we try to pat ourselves on the back and try to one-up the next person and look a little better, especially when we're feeling kind of bad. I think John was feeling bad, recalling the story. You know, they ran to the tomb, but John didn't go in. John wasn't gutsy enough like Peter. Peter, you know, he'd just pff, race into things, put his foot in his mouth most of the time from doing that. But, you know, Peter had a, enough guts to go into there and see for himself what was going on. So John's maybe trying to make himself feel better, saying, oh, I'll bet if I beat him, I was faster. I wanted it more. <laughs> I don't know. But you can, can you imagine when the disciples hear this news? You know, Mary comes and, hey, the Lord, he's not there. The tomb's empty. And they all go, oh, let's go check it out. <laughs> or they speed walk. No, I mean, they booked it. They ran. But you know what? You and I, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. You know, you're on Facebook and you, you see another mom and, and what they're doing, you know, and they're always making homemade goodies or they're playing games with the kids and their home looks immaculately clean and you go, man, I hate that woman. <laughs> their hair is always nice. They look like June Cleaver always wearing a nice dress and pearls while they're cleaning the house or whatever, right? Or, or we do this, we compare marriages. You know, oh, look at them. They go on dates together. Oh, look at that family. They have, they have family devotionals together. Oh, look at those guys. Look at that couple. They play pickleball <laughs> together. We do that. We do that comparison thing. Or 
you know, we'll go, look at them. Look how many more followers they have than I do. Look at that post. That got way more likes than mine, you know. Oh, they have more influence. Oh, they're in better shape. Oh, they have more money. Oh, he has more hair. You know, whatever. We do it. And if you think John was the only one that did that whole comparison game, no. Our good friend Peter, he does the same thing. Right in the next chapter. So chapter 20, you got John doing the whole, hey, I was faster than Peter thing. And then in John chapter 21, and we covered that not too long ago, we talked about that passage where the disciples go back to fishing and somebody from the shore says, you guys catch anything? No, cast in on the other side. They do it, big haul. John goes, that's got to be Jesus. Peter jumps in, swims over there. We have the whole restoration of Peter. You know, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, right? And right after that, right after Jesus kind of restores Peter and says, hey, Peter, all is forgiven. Do this now. Become the, the guy that I know you can be. And Peter does this. He does his comparison thing with John. <clears throat> Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if you want him to remain, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So Jesus says, Peter, this is your calling. You're going to be the big man. you got to step up. Okay, no denying me anymore. Are you ready? You love me? Peter's like, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm good. I've got it. I'm going to take on this calling. But what about him, Lord? What about that guy? What about him? Huh? Hmm? Huh? Hmm? Lord? Huh? Hmm? What about that guy? What about that? What's he going to do? How come you're not picking on him? <laughs> you know, whatever. And Jesus goes, hey, if... If I want him to live until I return, that's my business. That's not your business. You do you. You do the calling I gave you. Don't be worrying about him. Stop comparing your calling. Stop comparing what you weren't designed to accomplish. You can't fulfill God's purpose for you when you're comparing it to someone else's. That's a no-win scenario. No win. The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it. It's going to destroy your marriage. It's going to kill your contentment. It's going to steal your joy. And it's going to end your calling. Again, you are perfectly created by God to fulfill God's purpose for you. No one else can do it. No one else can do it. And if I can go back to a, a verse and, a, and an illustration that I talked about, if you, if you never heard my race story, it's become legend now. It's epic. <laughs> but I think God gave me that experience to share, to use as an illustration. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, And let us run with endurance the race God has set before what? Us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We all have a race to run. I can't run Jack's race. I can only run mine. I can't run Judy's race. I'm not supposed to. That's her race to run. And I can't win it. I can't win somebody else's race. I can only win the one that I was called to run. It's impossible to win someone else's race. It's a no-win comparison. How do we win? What's it say in that verse? 
We win by keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's at the end of the finish line. He's calling you in. Let's go. Let's go. You got this. You can do this. Yes, I ran track back in the day when I was a kid. And one of the things that I learned was the fastest way to lose the race is to look around, especially behind. Okay? Because the moment you look over your shoulder to see who else is running, who else may be catching you, it breaks your stride, it breaks your momentum, and it can even take you out of your lane. It can cost you the race. No. You fix your eyes ahead. You fix your eyes on the prize at the end of the race. You fix it on Jesus. And you're running not to please people, and you're running to please your Heavenly Father. And you're running to win. <clears throat> and maybe you're thinking, well, Barry, you don't struggle. You're doing okay. There are days where I can't out-succeed my insecurities. In the early years of doing ministry, I compared myself a ton. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was in over my head on so many things. I, I told Brenda this. I used to live on Pepto-Bismol Sunday mornings. If I could buy it in the gallon, I would. Because I was just a wreck every Sunday morning. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, this like, oh my goodness, this is too much for me. I was just like, ugh. And if I went out and I preached and, and God was good some Sundays and I, I as uh, my brother Fellow minister uh, Norm Bottle used to say, you knocked one out of the park. For as many times as I would knock one out of the park, I'd maybe not knocked one out of the park. And I'm like, ah, oh, I wanted to knock one out of the park again. And I just felt so bad. I used to play baseball too. I used to be pretty good at baseball. And on occasion, I'd, I'd get a home run. But every time I went up to bat, I wanted a home run. And if I didn't get a home run, I was mad at myself. And it was the same thing when I was preaching, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, why couldn't I do it good all the time? And even today, it's easy to compare myself to other pastors I know. And it's easy to compare this church to other churches. A friend and former co-worker of mine Wes Lindy just started a, a church plant in Duncan. Like just started, not too long ago. They already have 120 people. Man, it's so easy to compare and go, oh, why can't, why can't that be us? Why can't that be me? Why can't I do that? It's not my race. It's not my calling. And nobody can do what I am doing here. God chose me to love my wife. God chose me to raise my boys. God chose me to come to this church, to lead, to encourage, to care for, and feed this flock. I'm here for a purpose, and you are here for a purpose that only you can do. So what are you doing? God didn't call you to run my race. God didn't call you to live my purpose or fulfill my calling. He's called you to yours. So what is it? To love your spouse, to raise your kids, to use your talents, to lead your flock. 
keep your eyes on the prize. If it's a business, run your business with integrity. Maybe it's not the biggest, but you're gonna do it right. God called you to be a dad, then be a godly dad. You don't have to be the richest. You don't have to have the biggest house. But how about having the biggest heart for God, for your wife and for your kids? Maybe God's blessed you financially. Then maybe he's called you to give generously. Maybe you don't have the biggest income, but you're going to give and you're going to use what you have for God's glory. You're going to be a faithful steward of your time and your talents and your treasure. You're going to practice hospitality. You're going to raise your babies with Christian values. And you're going to make your home a place that honors God. We're a masterpiece, you and I. We've been created to do good works that he prepared for you to do. And you're perfectly created to fulfill God's purpose for you. You can't win someone else's race. That's a no win. But you can win yours. You can win yours.